So um, this is going to be very much in line with what Jan um, presented to you. It's just more of a technical focus, uh, really more than a business focus. You can see how things are going to tie together. Uh, one thing to say about uh, talking about tomato and onion seed production in, in one hour, uh, in my seed production course, I talk about tomato seed production in an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so what I tried to do was try to take uh, elements of both of these uh, presentations and tie it in to, uh, to pollen and uh, pollen testing and uh, pollen management, basically. And uh, so from that perspective, uh, I'm hoping that you folks will you know, review in your own mind what you're seeing and saying, well, okay, how does, how does this pollen testing uh, really impact me? How can I use it? What do I see as a value of it? So I'm going to be giving you a lot of hints, basically, more than anything else. Now, uh, um, Marcel had already talked pretty much about all of my resume here, so I didn't, I'm not going to go through it again. I just wanted to uh, show you uh, this right here. This is my salsa label. Um, I, I, I uh, produce my own salsa with my homegrown heirloom tomatoes and heirloom peppers. Batch 5 was the first time I grew salsa and made salsa, and the fifth time I, I did it that year was the best, so that's my, that's my label. Let's see, advance. Okay, so one of the things uh, really that I wanted to start with is a few slides just in, from a general perspective. And the first thing really is, you know, what are the key current influencers? And the first one, obviously, we've talked about quite a bit already, climate change. Um, I know that Jan probably remembers in the old days when we had production manuals. In fact, I think you wrote one yourself, uh, which was the recipe. We can't do that anymore because year to year things change and it becomes quite an influencer in terms of seed production. Agronomy, uh, the importance of growing a balanced plant, and I'll talk to you about a balanced plant, but a balanced plant basically is probably the optimum in terms of seed production where you have a balance between the vegetative and generative stage of a plant. That is more critical now than ever because you want something that's rustic to go through uh, the seed production process. Economics, of course, you can see right here, uh, prices in terms of labor, inputs and transportation specifically, but even beyond that, everything is basically going up. And IP protection, you know, once your line is, uh, is stolen, it's pretty much too late. And so that's, that's really gotten to the point where we use a lot more um, methods such as pollen farms to protect that, and, uh, and, and John had already mentioned that. So the balanced plant concept, if you see, if you look at the, look at the plants at the left, here we go. At the left right here, you can see that it's extremely vegetative. It's not balanced at all. And when you have a plant like this, this is in Thailand, when you have a plant like this, odds are that the pollen is probably not going to be that good, and you're not going to set a lot of fruit. Here to the right is the plant which is balanced, and the way that I explain that is visually, you can see that half of that picture is tomatoes, and half of it is leaves. So that's a really balanced plant, and there should be some pretty good seed set there. So the pollen trap, this is sort of a metaphor that I use uh, because obviously we're, we're, we're absolutely certain that pollen is an extremely important part of seed, seed production because with no pollen, there's no seed production. But we can't get caught up into the fact that pollen is the only thing. And so I want to kind of just uh, uh, go through some of the other factors that we have to consider. One is the interline genetic compatibility. How compatible genetically is one line with the other? And this whole area of flower development and sex expression. Um, you have basically the pistil and the stamens uh, sort of dancing with each other, um, and it's, it takes two to tango. So really, don't forget about the, 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 the female parts of the flower. And I think someone else is going to use that, uh, that as well. Cell pollination versus cross-pollination, fertility, fertilization, and embryogenesis. That's a very elegant process that, that, that has a lot of... Um, situations where you can have a bad or a good effect. And then you have the pollinators. You have the bees and other insects. You have people. And then, of course, you have the whole aspect of seed maturation and development, which takes a period of, of weeks in many cases. So you have the climatic factors, the agronomic factors, and the human factors associated with that. And so then you harvest the seed, and then you have to handle it in the proper way in terms of timing and preventing seed damage. So there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. But for sure, when you go back to pollen, if you don't know about the pollen, uh, 
then you don't know whether or not it had an impact. And so it's a tool that has to be in the toolbox. Now this is just, uh, just a, uh, a picture of a pollen, uh, uh, pollen grain germinating. And what I think, what I want to just sort of uh, highlight basically is you can see that basically this is a living thing, okay? I mean, some people think that, you know, that they forget about that. And it's such a, an elegant sort of situation that basically the amount of cytoplasm here is maintained at an equal level by putting these, uh, what they call these plugs so that as it grows, the amount of cytoplasm stays the same. And you can kind of see the plugs here uh, in, in these uh, styles. So the point here is it's very, very alive. And here is something that is, kind of shows you how alive this is. This is, this is a pollen tube being attracted to an ovary. And you can see on the right, because it's, it, it's a little bit different of a color, but you can see how that cytoplasm is moving uh, up there. Isn't that great? That's cool, isn't it? Okay, so pollen testing, the fulcrum of seed production. Anybody know what a fulcrum is? Okay, I got a definition here. It's a thing that plays a central or a central role in an activity, event, or situation. Okay, so with regard to pollen te testing, data. Data collected over time provides a baseline for the lines, what we could, would call the pollen performance. So that's historical data that we can put in and really rely upon for future productions. And it confirms whether or not the male plants are growing well. The first thing that gets impacted by a bad situation in, in plant development is pollen. You've got to remember that. And basically then, obviously, you want to make sure that, the, that you have sufficient pollen uh, quantity and viability with a pollen harvest. During the handling and, po and, uh, and, and, and uh, storage is maintained, and also with regard to a timing of pollination. So the other thing that uh, the last point here was kind of interesting that I think people don't understand, but you can really or have the opportunity to be testing the pollen from emasculated flowers to determine if there's any viability there. And that gives you an idea of whether or not, am I going to have some selfing? Am I going to have uh, some situations where I'm not going to get hybrid seed, and in fact, it's self-seed? So it's another opportunity to use uh, pollen testing uh, from a genetic predictability standpoint. And obviously, in the situation here, what you do dynamically, which John had mentioned, in the field versus what you can do in the future, it really depends upon the crop. And so I'm going to focus on tomatoes and onions to kind of demonstrate that. So this uh, probably looks like a very busy slide, but basically, uh, and I'm sorry that people online are, are not able to watch me go through this, but it, this is really the, um, the timeline of bringing a, a new variety to market in terms of producing commercial seed and optimizing seed producibility. And you can see here all of the functions within a seed company, and particularly here, as you see this PR in red, that's production research. And so the point uh, I make here is that basically production research should start way up here. And it should be considered a process and not an organization or a number of people. It's a way of thinking in my mind. And really in, in terms of, uh, of the value of pollen testing and pollen viability testing, most of this really should be coming here in terms of finish line development as well as in foundation seed. Now foundation seed, you know, there's some terminology issues, right? I mean, some people would call foundation seed foundation seed. Others would call it pre-basic. Uh, some people call breeder seed uh, pre-basic and this basic. The bottom line is this is when the line is fixed and it's produced, two quantities so that it can support the life, the lifeline of the whole variety life cycle. And uh, obviously that's a little bit difficult to predict, but you want to make sure that basically this stuff here is the foundation for anything that is produced from pilot production to the extended trials and then to all the stock seed, which is, eventually produces commercial seed. So here in the finish line development, this is where you basically have sort of the choices between SIBs. You're about F6 or so, and you, you're looking at horticultural traits, but one of the things you should be looking for as well is pollen viability, because that becomes very, very important in terms of what happens for the life cycle, the, the, the whole life cycle of that variety. 
So why tomatoes and onions as examples? So there's quite a few, sim there's not very many similarities, but one is, is that they're all over the place, uh, all over the globe. Onions and tomatoes, you can find them everywhere. And really from a, a value standpoint, and you can argue with the statistics, but they're the two most valuable vegetable crops globally. And bo in both cases, there is a huge multitude of horticultural types. Uh, the third similarity, basically, that, uh, that I can see, and it's kind of a stretch in a way, but I mean, they, they both uh, produce seeds sequentially, and they flower sequentially for approximately three to four weeks. In some cases, on some other onions may do more, but it's that sequential aspect of things which makes them pretty, pretty similar. But then there's a huge number of differences. So from an agronomic standpoint, tomato is pretty straightforward. Onion seed production agronomy is, is, is very complex and complicated by the fact that you have bulbs and, and CMS and all of these other things associated with it. Tomato is an annual, onion is a biennial. Tomato has day length neutral. Uh, onions is day length sensitive with regard to the bulbing. So that makes it complicated in terms of where you can produce the bulbs. You have wet seed as a tomato, you have dry seed as onions, and you have tomatoes, which is harvested to about a minimum of 25 uh, fruit per plant, and onions, your seed is harvested one to several umbels per plant. So basically, you're managing plants in tomatoes, you're managing hectares or surface in onions. Tomatoes are hand-pollinated, and onions are bee-pollinated, and beyond that, they are produced by CMS, uh, cytoplasmic male sterility. And finally, uh, tomato is produced in both open field and controlled environment cir circumstances, whereas onion is primarily produced in open field. So I took those two as kind of uh, two examples of two different categories uh, of, uh, of vegetable seed, uh, vegetable crops. Okay, so let's just talk about tomatoes then. First, the context. It's a super valuable crop in the world. Now, it's hard to get accurate numbers, uh, you know, uh, they, they tend to vary, but the, the key point here is that $190 billion, and it's expected to grow to $273 billion, which is even more than corn. That's, uh, that, that's how valuable this tomato crop is. And it's probably the most widely, uh, widespread vegetable in the world, along with onions. So again, those uh, two, two crops being very similar from that perspective. And in terms of a species of esculentum, they have more types of tomatoes than any other vegetable crop as a, at a species level. And the price can vary to $25, $30 a uh, kilo to over hundreds of thousands in rare cases. So it's extremely price, uh, price sensitive. And there are probably more seed companies in the world that produce tomatoes than any other crop. So it's a big deal, and we should pay attention to it. Major horticultural types, and I show here in parentheses relative yields. Uh, so you have primarily indeterminates and determinates. Uh, indeterminates being primarily fresh market, determinates fresh market and processor. There are semi-determinates as well, but it's a minor category. And the one thing to, uh, a couple things to, to uh, notice here is that basically, when you have round types and indeterminate and round types, for example, indeterminate, they're, they're going to have similar uh, yield potentials. And so you can see in some of these, like the salad debts and the romas and what have you, where you have them in both, in both categories, you have an opportunity actually to, to increase the yields of those crops. And one of the ways of doing that is to pay more attention to pollen viability. In terms of production areas, now here's something that, uh, that, that uh, you should pay attention to. So you have open field, you have net house, you have plastic house, you have glass house, and then beyond those categories, you have all of these locations in the world where tomatoes produce. And do you think really realistically that the pollen viability in Chile in a plastic house will be the same as China uh, in open field? So... In the, in the whole scheme of things, we're talking about something that's this valuable. You really need to be able to pinpoint and understand all the aspects of, of how those crops can be produced successfully at high yields. And, and, and understanding the pollen viability 
of even the same variety in different areas and different uh, circumstances, I think for me, is quite valuable. So relevant facts about tomato seed production. So I don't want to go through everything here, but I do want to point out a couple of things. One is uh, in terms of, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to turn because I can't read that. In terms of, uh, of, of soil, so a lot of the high-value varieties are grown in various substrates. So there's an opportunity, depending upon if you're growing it in, in cocoa peat versus rock wool, uh, you have an opportunity to understand whether or not the pollen viability is going to be different under those circumstances. The other point to make here is that with regard to irrigation, it's important in the male line to make a consistent regime that should be at a relative deficit level of irrigation at field capacity. Why do you think that should be? Basically, you're going to want to keep that in a more generative state for more flowers and more opportunity to produce a higher uh, quantity of, of, of pollen. The other thing uh, to point out is micronutrients. So boron, manganese, and zinc are very important in pollen and seed development. And it's often very much overlooked. Um, and, and so that's a key thing to think about with regard to um, uh, if your pollen viability can be tied to those sorts of things. So those are the key things to, to remember. OK, so here's uh, some relevant facts about tomato pollen. And this is a tomato flower, obviously. And a couple things to really pay attention to is and, and that you have to key in on basically. So here are the here are the stamens. The or, I'm sorry, the anthers, which are conal and they're conal around the the stigma style and ovary or the pistil. And the other thing to pay attention to is the yellow color of the petals. These are two important characteristics of a tomato fell, a flower that visually you pay attention to. So for the folks online, what I am looking at actually is in terms of the developmental stage three through five. So right here is four is anthesis, and you can see sort of how the flower looks with regard to the cone of the pollen and the, and the petals. And you can see two days after anthesis that it's completely open. And so between these two, the opening flower and anthesis, this is where typically the male flowers are going to be harvested and the pollen is going to be extracted. But with all of those horticultural types, there's going to be some that are going to be maybe over here and others that are going to be maybe over here. And there could be something maybe over here, but I doubt it. But the key point here is if you're not testing for pollen viability at these different stages and getting that data, you may be harvesting uh, uh, a pollen which is not as viable as you would like. And just to kind of show that in, in really more stark terms, you can see on the left that this flower on the left is exactly, what, two days past anthesis. And look what's happening. All of the, all of the, um, the uh, stamens, is, is, all of the pollen is being basically already germinated and, for all practical purposes, gone from a harvest standpoint. Obviously, you can see that it's pollinated, that flower. But you can lose a lot of pollen quality, uh, both in terms of quantity and, and quality, by not harvesting the flowers at the right time. But what is the right time? You're going to have to do the testing from a pollen viability standpoint to understand that. OK, so relevant facts about tomato pollen. So, in general, pollen development is considered the most heat-sensitive stage in plant development. So that's, a, that's a, another reason why you want to monitor that, because it gives you some ideas about the plant health itself. And tomato pollen is especially so. Optimal growing conditions for tomatoes in general, 20, 28, 26 to 28 degrees C and 20 to 22 at night, day temperatures versus night. That's a small range. That's a small range of temperatures, actually. And so you want to make sure that in terms of, of your pollen, that you're operating under those uh, parameters. Heat stress can take uh, place as early as the initial flower bud stage. So even before a flower is open in tomatoes, if you got high heat, 
you've already damaged the, uh, the, uh, the pollen. So if you're not testing for the viability of it, you're never going to know that. And really, in terms of pollination, so this is an important point. So pollination uh, is effective at an optimum of 70% humidity. So that's when you put the pollen on the stigma, right? It's not when you harvest the pollen. The pollen, you want to be harvested at lower humidity. So it's drier. And that means the next day you're going to be using this pollen. So de facto, it's not very often that you're going to harvest pollen and use it the same day. You're going to have to store it at least for a short period of time. So the whole aspect of, you know, st uh, of pollen storage and management becomes a big, big issue. And it takes approximately 2.5 flowers to provide one gram of dry pollen. That's average. But if, for example, uh, in, in your pollen collection, if, you're take, if it's taking five flowers for one gram, well, you're probably not producing a lot of pollen. And so you can kind of use this as a, as a bit of a baseline. Pollen, so a lot of this data on pollen storage life, uh, life, uh, lifetime is, is it's, hard to, it's hard to get good numbers on, but basically you can say it's relatively, stores relatively well. A few, a few days under ambient conditions, up to 30 days in a refrigerator with a desiccant, and up to six months with a desiccant at minus 20 degrees C. Now, obviously, if you're starting to use liquid nitrogen and that sort of thing, uh, then, of course, it's going to be able to last a much, much longer time. But just in practical purposes, this, these are sort of the rules that you can kind of go by. With regard to uh, pollen co uh, collection, you can see on the left the flowers. You can see that it's not yet open. So, again, it goes back to that, uh, that, that other slide that I showed you as to when you should be collecting the male flowers. You collect it, you basically dry it um, you know, with, with a, a high wattage bulb or a desiccant. You get the pollen and then basically uh, once that's done uh, and you go through some other steps obviously, you're putting it into a little receptacle in order to do the pollination. So you can see just in those three steps uh, uh, it themselves that something can go wrong. And so it's important for you to monitor that whole set of circumstances, and you can't do that without testing for pollen. And then eventually, I mean, in terms of emasculation, you uh, get the sepals out of the way, you take the anthers out, now you've got a flower which is uh, antherless, and then basically you do the pollination, and you mark the fruit, and eventually, if you do that all right, you get that, uh, that, that result. If... In fact, the pollen you're using is, uh, is uh, of high viability. And your emasculation is done so it doesn't damage the other part of the tango, right? Okay, so the potential for just-in-time pollen testing in tomato at the breeding level, again, going back to the chart I showed you, selection tool uh, when choosing amongst siblings in terms of pollen viability and quantity. And... You can also monitor the status of elite male line pollen preservation. So in, in many breeding programs, particularly when you're talking about these high-value tomatoes that you, you get tens, tens of thousands, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a kilo, if you got a male line which is just perfect, you're going you're to want to uh, save the pollen of that line. So that in the breeding program, you could continue to use that, uh, that in, in crossing. And so you can, you, you can monitor uh, you know, how well that pollen is lasting over time. In parent seed, of course, you continue with the confirmation of the pollen viability and quantity parameters that are established earlier. And you basically now are starting to have an opportunity to talk about the agronomy, so irrigation, fertilization, that sort of thing, best practices, uh, f because in the fa at the uh, parent seed level, particularly foundation, you've got a small surface, so you can, you can, you can uh, take advantage of that. For me, in commercial seed, the whole thing is about pollen farms. This is where things are going. Uh, this is where things have been in China because of IP concerns. So what can you do uh, in terms of uh, just-in-time pollen testing with regard to pollen farms? Well, obviously, best practices for pollen collection, drying, and storage. You want to be best of class in that. He asked the question, collect the pollen today? So if you're in a tomato pollen farm, you have an opportunity, because that's all you got are males. 
And so you go out, you test your pollen, and maybe it's just not as high as you had normally got. I said, no harvest today. The other thing is, and, and, and Jan mentioned this, is pollen sublotting. So you can, you can actually sublot, just like seeds, pollen based upon their, uh, their uh, viability. And also, clearly, to be able to confirm your pollen uh, viability before you ship it from the farm and where you receive it. You can also use it for setting and confirming uh, the uh, controlled environment parameters uh, in these high, uh, uh, high value tomato productions in terms of substate, relative humidity, temperature, because you can dial these things in. And so, again, because of the value of those of the tomato seed under those circumstances, it's, it's probably worth doing. And, of course, we talked about setting, uh, confirming uh, whether or not your emasculation in female lines has been done properly and also from the, from the viability of those flowers. And also, obviously, uh, John had mentioned this, improved crop planning and crop placement. So if, you, if you're on top of things and you understand from a data management standpoint historically uh, what your pollen vi viability means for an ultimate outcome, you can start planning for your next, your next production. Okay, so I wonder if I should take questions on tomatoes before I go to onions. Continue? Okay. Okay, we're going to switch, switch your mind to a whole different deal. So onions at a glance. Uh, this is basically what you see when things go well. Um, every, every onion seed company loves to see this, particularly the, the photo on the right. How often do you get this? It's, it's, a, it's an amazing sort of situation when you know everything goes right. And the only thing everything goes right is, first of all, you have good pollen viability, but obviously all of the other factors that we mentioned earlier have to be in line as well. So now onions is not as valuable as tomatoes from a value standpoint. And this is just dried onions at 4.2 billion, but it's expected to grow uh, almost double. Um, but, but the other point to make here is that, you know, again, it's, it's along with tomatoes, they're, very, they're everywhere. And, uh, from, but from a standpoint of the surface, and now this is when we start talking about something which is a high-value crop versus a low-value crop, all of a sudden now you're having to produce more hectares of that to get that value. So in, in each case, there's about 5 million hectares of both tomatoes and onions. And it belongs to the genus Allium. So we talked about tomatoes and as esculentum as being, you know, the, the, the most diverse species in the world. Well, onions as a genus, Allium, is the most diverse in the world. It's notoriously inconsistent, and you can understand why, because of all of the issues associated with it, which we'll get into. And that explains why there's very few seed companies that actually, compared to tomatoes, are producing onions because, um, wow, I, I bow my <laughs> head to seed companies that, that successfully produce onion year in and year out. The other thing to consider is that really it's considered a commodity vegetable uh, because it's an important in the diets uh, uh, in the underdeveloped country. So COGS is a big deal. So think about this. I mean, you want to be as good as possible with regard to the data that you get to be able to produce successfully onion seed uh, in order to keep the cogs down because that means your margin is, uh, with the, is, on onions is just not as great as what you're going to find in tomatoes. One thing to consider, horticultural types, again, there are shape variances, there's color variances, there's variances in terms of bolting resistance, which is a big deal, because think about, you know, a commercial uh, onion grower does not want bolters. Seed, uh, seed producers do. Uh, so you have to deal with that particular issue. So there's a lot of different uh, aspects to the different horticultural types, which you can infer that there's going to be a lot of differences within these types with regard to pollen viability. These are the major seed production areas for onions. Uh, you can see it's quite diverse. Um, so it's, it's, it's produced in a number of different uh, parts of the world, and I probably don't even have all of them here. Uh, 
Um, there's always this I issue within seed companies though, that they think that they have all these secrets, you know. And, uh, and uh, in my seed production course, I tell, I'll tell everybody, okay, 80% of what you know, your colleague knows. The other 20% is secret, so you don't have to talk about the secrets. So there's two ways to produce onions. One is seed to seed, and the other is bulb to seed. And really, it gets down to one major condition, and that is the cost of goods for seed to seed is lower than in bulbs. And you can see the reason why. In seed to seed, you play, plant the seeds in the fall, and then it fertilizes, and it grows to a certain size. It, it fertilizes in the, in the, throughout the winter, and you harvest it the next year. So it's about a 10-month cycle. And so that's pretty, that's pretty, uh, pretty good in terms from a, from a cog standpoint, whereas when you're talking about bulbs, now all of a sudden you're going to have to be dealing with about two years' worth of production, and you're going to have to be dealing with more or less probably a hand, hand labor harvest because of the, you get more, you get more uh, umbels on a, from a bulb than you do from a seed. But you have to consider some things. So winter hardiness, for example, if you have something which is, doesn't have any winter hardiness, you're not going to be able to produce it seed to seed. You're going to have to go bulb to seed. And the other thing to consider also is that with, when you're talking about parent seed, you're going to have to go bulb to seed because you want to select out the bad bulbs, either from a color standpoint or from a shape standpoint. Timing. So, for example, if the male and the female have a difference in, in uh, time within flowering, you're not going to be able to go seed to seed because seed to seed, everything is going to bolt at the same time, which means you're not going to nick. And also you have to deal with the idea of chilling requirements. How much, how much low temperature are you going to need? If you really need a lot, it's better to do bulbs because you can control that. You cannot control the chilling in seed to seed production. So complications there. And the thing of it is, is that if you put these uh, varieties under the wrong seed production scenario, you're going to affect pollen viability. So relevant facts about seed production, I'm not going to go through all these, I'm just going to highlight. So one of the important things to think about is that sh you have shallow fibrous root systems, and so to, with the bulbing together, you, you require well-drained soils for the bulbing, but you require good moisture retention for the shallow roots. So you have to be very careful about the type of soil that you're using. And the other thing is with regard to pH. So once you get above 6.5, these are the deficiencies that you get. Guess what? Manganese and zinc. Manganese and zinc. So you have to be very careful about uh, uh, how, what sort of pH uh, you're growing your tomatoes in. The other thing to think about as well, uh, I think as you get down to the pollination, is that obviously the lack of pollen in the male, feral, uh, male sterile line is not generally attracted to bees. That's the big issue uh, with, with regard to onion seed production. So you're, use, you're needing to use, in many cases, different types of insects. And the sequential flowering in each umbel directly exposed the flower period for up to four to five weeks to changes in weather. Well, okay, put that in the context of climate change. So now you have this seed development thing going on. And in flowering, it's going to take... Uh, it could take up to four to five weeks in an umbel for all of those flowers, basically, to, uh, to open. And under those circumstances, then, you're going to have to really, from a, from, if you're interested in testing for pollen, you're going to have to do that over an a, a extended length of time. And as John mentioned, when you talk about onion people, they're willing to do that if you can do it in the field. The other, the other thing to consider is, 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 is protandry. And I'll show you pollen trying in a minute, but that can, in some cases, create what we call pollen mismatches. So this is a this is a a, a drawing by my colleague Ron Amaral, and uh, he basically, <laughs> I think, does the right thing because protandries basically means that the stigma is not receptive when the pollens are being shed. Okay. And so, okay, what does, that, what does that mean in terms of, you know, if you're talking about male sterility, we'll talk about that in a minute. I mean, who cares, right? Well, if you've got all of these onion flowers sequentially flowering, you've got onions, uh, flowers at different stages throughout that field all the time. And it's, it, bees can be, actually land on a stigma which is not receptive. 
and so you lose the pollination. So that's one of the, one of the issues that need to be considered, and a lot of people don't consider in terms of onion seed uh, production. The day length factor. So this is another important aspect. So you have uh, extra long day onions, long day, intermediate day, and short day onions, and this is all associated with balding, okay? So short day requires 11 to 12 hours of sunlight, sunlight. Long days, 15 to 16 hours. So if you're trying to get bulbs for a long day onion in a short day er area, you're not going to get any bulbs. You'll probably get, you'll get bulbs of a short day onion if you produce it in a long day area, but you're not going to get well uh, shaped and formed bulbs, and it's not going to allow you to basically do any sorting. So the bottom line is, is that basically in terms of bulb to seed production, the bulbs have to be produced in the commercial areas uh, where those particular uh, onions are produced. Once they're, once they're there and you chill them, then you can produce them anywhere. So that's something to take into consideration. So in all of these cases, if you get out of sync with regard to how this is supposed to be, you're going to impact pollen viability. So the vernalization factor this is really important because, again, there's these great differences amongst varieties in terms of the response to low temperature and the length of time. Look at this, 5 to 15 degrees C. That's a big range. And 4 to 12 weeks. And combinations of all those means that you have all of these different um, requirements for vernalization to produce a good seed crop. And, and you get the bolting, because without bolting, you're not going to get much uh, good, um, good flower development as well as pollen. And plants that belong... So, so basically what you have to do is you have to wait for this plant to get to a juvenile stage, past the juvenile stage, which is basically five to six true leaves, and then what's called a neck, which is that area down near the soil, has to be more than 10 uh, um, millimeters. I say, well, okay, why don't we just... We plant it and we do that. Well, in seed to seed production, one of the issues is, you know, you need to plant uh, late enough in the summer or the fall to be able to get the chill. But if you're, if you're producing seed to seed and you're putting seed in the soil, which is above 30 degrees C, you have an issue. And the same thing with regard to the onions growing at high temperatures. So in a lot of cases, I know that a lot of people have tried to do uh, seed to seed production of short day onions in the Central Valley of California. One year it works great, and the next year, phew, it doesn't. So trying to hit that spot is, uh, is, is pretty challenging. The time factor. So again, this is something that Ron Amaral sent me. So this is basically comparing, uh, and for those of you online, um, I'm looking at seed to seed. Pretty nice, huh? Ten months. I'll take ten months. Uh, maybe. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit longer than that, but in those ten months, a lot of things can go wrong. But if you're bulb to seed, now all of a sudden you're, you're planting sometime around September, October of 2017. And then you're growing those bulbs and you harvest those bulbs in May. And now you've got to store the bulbs because you've got to vernalize them one way or the other. And depending upon what the parameters are, you're either going to have to put it into cold storage or you can just, you know, you can just store them in the shade you know, if the requirements aren't that high. And then eventually you harvest the seed in 2019. 22 months, 22 months, and then stock seeds. You remember, you remember the, uh, the comment that I made that you've got to go bulb to seed in, uh, in, in the parent seed, and particularly when you're associated with uh, the CMS and uh, all of that hassle. So all together, you've got 3.6 years, and if you put together from that standpoint the planning of the sales of that stuff, which was probably a year before that, this becomes a pretty complicated process. And so when you produce onion seeds, you don't want to screw it up, even though you have all of these factors against you. And so, again, if, if pollen uh, testing is available, it's got to be a toolbox in this crop. Okay. Okay, I'm not going to go through the genetics of cytoplasmic male sterility. Basically, the point I want to make First of all, the A line is the male sterile line. Okay, that's the one that doesn't have any viable pollen. 
And the B line is basically the same thing as, and typically the same thing as the A line, uh, horticulturally and genetically, but it's just without the male sterile gene. So you cross A by B to continue to maintain A. And A then goes into commercial production. You can always increase B by itself just by putting it into a cage or an isolation because it's got pollen and it's going to do it. And so then you produce A by C, you get a sterile hybrid. But in the whole scheme of things, what you've th got to think about from a pollen standpoint is what you're doing is for one commercial hybrid, you're actually producing two hybrid types, right? Because you have to, you have to cross the A line by the B line to maintain it, so that's a hybrid cross, in order to be used to produce the hybrid. So that just doubles the complications uh, associated with onions. And here you can see on the left, this is, a, this is a fertile flower, and on the right, you can see that is the sterile flower. And you can probably understand why bees that are collecting pollen may be not interested in the female much. So the relevant facts about onion pollen, basically, same sort of thing with regard to uh, tomatoes. Uh, onion pollen is probably considered to be more resilient in this sense than tomato pollen. And this has some evolutionary aspects to it because when you think about uh, tomato pollen, uh, it's, it's, within, uh, it's, in, it's in a flower that's a lot more protected. In onion, that, that flower is not as protected and it's much more exposed to the environment. So evolutionarily, it's, it's, it's got to be uh, more resilient. And it, it actually will, uh, uh, seed will set over a longer range, and which implies that the pollen is actually more viable at higher temperatures than tomatoes. So pollen viability is the highest on the day of anthesis, and dehiscence follows from early morning hours throughout the day. So basically, you say, well, okay, well, why don't we time our pollinations when that happens? Well, because of the sequential flowering uh, pattern in onions, all those flowers are in all different stages of development all at the same time. And so it doesn't really help you by knowing this, to be honest with you. And with regard to storage, I mean, it, from, from, again, from the data that we know, it doesn't store as well, uh, except for under low humidity and temperature conditions. And even under that, as you can see, uh, it, it loses uh, germination uh, quite significantly uh, uh, from the initial germination, even in good uh, storage conditions. These are pragmatic storage conditions. Again, if you're, if you're storing this stuff under liquid nitrogen and what have you, it's, it's obviously going to last a long time. Okay, so what I want to show here, and, and this goes back to crop planting, which John had mentioned, and what I'm, and what I'm comparing here is, I've got to go here. Here we go. Okay, so what I want to do is I have a seed-to-seed -seed example, which is typically long-day varieties. And so in the northern hemisphere, basically, you're planting in August. You go through the various stages, and I would want to qualify that, you know, this isn't um, exact science. There is, some, there is some play here with regard to, you know, when these, these things happen. But in the whole scheme of things, you're getting your pollination between April and May in a seed to seed situation in the Northern Hemisphere. And in the Southern Hemisphere, you're planting in February. So you cannot in, in, in influence your Southern Hemisphere production in seed to seed situation by understanding the data of whether or not your pollen is viable here. But, by the same token, you can influence the planting of next year's Northern Hemisphere production because by now, you're actually in a perfect situation to plan for it. So, getting back to John's point, if you're, if you're serious about uh, testing pollen viability early and every, all thing, other things being equal, if that pollen viability doesn't look good, you may want to take an opportunity to say, you know what? We've got to make sure that in our planting for next year in this area that we have the best growers and it allows you to select the best land. Remember that soil is extremely important. So that data helps you in a seed to seed situation, but only in terms of the, the crop to be planted in the same hemisphere. When you go bulb to seed, however, 
we talk about uh, Southern California desert, where you're planting here in October, November, you're going through the, all of this process of the bulbs, and you're you have a pollination and, and seed, here's your pollination. So basically, well, you know that in the southern hemisphere, this is the same time that you're planting the bulbs. Or that you're, plant, you're also planting the, 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 seed, the, the, uh, the new seed crop. So if you got some early indications here that you have an issue, you have an opportunity to make some adjustments here. And equally so, in the southern hemisphere, you're, you, if you get data here, you can actually Im influence the planting in terms of what you're going to plant and how much for this subsequent uh, crop in the northern hemisphere. So for me, that's pretty valuable when you're talking about a crop that's that long uh, in terms of duration when you're growing it. Okay, so in terms of, of onions, uh, basically, for the most part, it's pretty much the same as tomatoes except for now. You're needing to, you, you, you got some opportunities to be looking at selections for both the male and the maintainer, the maintainer of the sterile line. So if we've thrown that into, uh, into, the, into the mix. And in parrot seed production, pretty much the same thing again. But again, it could be that you want to look at the pollen viability of the fertiles found in the male sterile line. So a male sterile line isn't always 100% sterile. Sometimes it throws what's called fertiles. And in your increase, you're going to want to understand how much of damage that's going to do to the genetics of your, of your crop. If you're going to create more fertiles the next year. And so understanding the viability of the pollen in those fertiles in the sterile increase becomes pretty important. And the other thing is, is that now you have an opportunity uh, because... You know, this is, yeah. Remember, pollen, or parent seed is under smaller surfaces, okay? And you remember that basically with shallow roots, you can have a possibility of actually intervening early. So if your uh, pollen viability is very low in the beginning, you can actually go in, particularly with the micronutrients, and perhaps in, uh, influence the viability of the pollen in the later flowers, because remember, it's, it's a sequential flowering situation. And in the commercial crop, uh, pretty much from my standpoint, the, the most important thing to think about really is uh, in terms of the um, ability to plan, the ability to plan that we just uh, described so that you can make adjustments in this long, long season crop. I keep on going back and forth. <laughs> huh. How come it's not giving me my... Oh, here we go. Oh, okay. All right, so for your consideration, I'm going to leave this here. This is the end of my presentation. So basically, uh, for upcoming... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm shamelessly advertising here. <laughs> but for up, upcoming seed business, uh, seed courses at UC Davis, these are the dates. Seed Business 101 is coming up November 27th through December 1st. Uh, that's a course where we basically uh, look at a case study of a fictitious seed company, and we go through all of the various functions in a, in a successful fic fictitious seed company, and uh, case studies associated with, uh, with product liability, new product introduction, and that sort of It's a five-day course, and, uh, and I'm a lead instructor on that. And the seed production course then comes up in February, and another one, which uh, I think you had mentioned, the seed biology, quality, and pathology will also be typically in June of next year. Uh, for available seed production software that includes pollen data collection component. So there's, there's production software out there that actually has uh, uh, the ability for you to collect pollen data and be able to use that data historically. And that's at seedmc.com. That's uh, my colleague Ron Amaral's uh, um, involved in that. And if you want to contact me directly, that's my, that's my email address. <laughs>